uh, my name is Gray, Gray Norton. I'm a technical lead and uh, manager on the Polymer team. And while I've been doing web stuff for a long time, I'm actually pretty new to the team. I just joined in May right before Google I.O. And I'm super excited to be here at my first Polymer, Polymer Summit. So today, we're going to be talking about data flow. Um, this is a topic that we get asked a lot about, especially now that more developers are building not only apps, uh, not only elements, but also apps with Polymer. Because um, Polymer basically provides a powerful set of low-level tools for managing data, but it's not very prescriptive about how you use them. It's really up to you to figure out how to structure uh, your app. And the fact is that the way you move data around can have a big impact on the performance of your app, on how productive you are in writing your app, on how easy your code is to test and debug, and on how well things scale as your app and your team grow. So we're going to cover a lot of ground, some old and some new, some that Rob touched on just a little bit ago. Um, but before we dive in, I thought it would be fun to kick off with a too long didn't watch slide. And I realize this might actually be a little bit risky because I'm all that stands between you and lunch. Um, so if you promise not to leave, I'll show you what's on it. Um, so this slide is you know, a little bit flip and intentionally oversimplified. I said a moment ago that Polymer isn't prescriptive, and that hasn't changed in the last 45 seconds. Um, but I wanted to start off by giving some props, if you'll excuse, excuse the pun, to unidirectional data flow. Um, Rob obviously is a big fan too, and frankly, you know, this is a hugely influential pattern uh, that, that really is, has come to dominate thinking in the front end world over the last couple of years, spurred largely by the, the React ecosystem. Um, and there's a lot of good there. Um, we think it's a great pattern for building apps with Polymer as well. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of Polymer app developers adopt it of their own volition. And it's something that you can expect to see more explicit support from us for going forward. OK, so with that spoiler out of the way, let's take a quick look at how we'll spend the next 20 minutes. First, I'm going to spend some time recapping last year's thinking in Polymer talk. Uh, with a focus on the aspects that are most relevant to data flow. Uh, and then we'll be into the meat of our agenda, reflecting on some key differences between building elements and building apps, exploring some trade-offs between unidirectional and bidirectional flow, and then touching again on a few of the changes that Rob mentioned around Polymer 2.0 in this area. So at last year's Polymer Summit, uh, our friend and colleague Kevin Schaff gave a great talk called Thinking in Polymer. And if you haven't seen it, I highly re recommend that you go to YouTube and check it out. Um, but this year, Kevin has more important business. Uh, he and his wife are expecting a baby girl any day now. Uh, so he stayed back in San Francisco. And I sincerely hope, since it's like 4.45 in the morning, that he's not watching. But in case he is, hey, Kevin, we miss you. <laughs> um, but in any case, his talk provides a useful foundation for our discussion. So I'm going to hit some of those highlights over the next few minutes. So for his talk, Kevin built this simple chat demo that you see up there. And there's no back end to it. He probably could have used Firebase and done really well, to be honest. Um, and it does just enough to be interesting. So you can view threads, post messages, edit thread titles, and that's about it. But it was a good lens for examining Polymer fundamentals. And it's also a good sandbox for us to explore some data flow ideas. So we'll use it again this year. And with that, let's jump right in. So what does it mean to think in Polymer? It all starts with components, of course. Um, but components you know, aren't unique to Polymer. Virtually every modern approach to front-end development is based on components. What does make Polymer different from many other frameworks and libraries is that instead of bringing its own component model, it uses the one that the browser provides, the DOM. So the DOM really has all the pieces of a basic component model, if you think of it. It gives you composition, letting you assemble views and apps from basic building blocks. It has some basic facilities for moving data around in the form of attributes and properties and events. It has a native declarative format that you may have heard of called HTML. And critically, extensibility. So with web components, for the first time, developers have the ability to extend the semantics of DOM. And that is, is really the, the missing piece to the puzzle. So Kevin's app showcased a number of custom elements produced by the Polymer team, 
like the ones you see here. But more importantly, it demonstrated how you can build your own reusable elements, like this input header, and how you can also compose your app from the, from the ground up or from the top down, depending on how you want to think about it, entirely using custom elements. So we've just made a pretty good pitch for the DOM and web components, but what's Polymer's role in this? Well, again, as, as Rob showed really clearly with his talk a few minutes ago, um, Polymer's purpose in life is to sprinkle a thin dusting of sugar over the web component goodness of the platform. Um, basically, our aim is to make it easier for you to build custom elements, whether you're developing reusable components or entire apps. And to that end, Polymer provides a declarative format for easily composing custom elements. Here, we're using it to build the input header for our chat view app. And, and the main point to note here is that this is just a native HTML template with some text annotations sprinkled in. And those text annotations manage the flow of properties between the host element and the elements within its shadow DOM. We'll take a closer look at those annotations in a couple of minutes. In the same vein, Polymer also provides some convenient helpers for defining your APIs and uh, behaviors for your elements, like this simple format which you know and love for declaring properties. But the features that, uh, that Polymer provides are really based around a certain way of thinking about uh, the component model. And uh, the way we think about it uh, is in a pattern called the mediator pattern. So in this pattern, a custom element acts as a mediator, encapsulating the elements that it's built from, orchestrating interactions between them, and exposing an API for other elements to use. Now, conceptually, you can think of a custom element in the mediator pattern as having a model that it uses to play its mediator role. And the model really, uh, as inputs, has facets of its own API. And it can pull a lot of levers that are exposed by the APIs of the elements that it encapsulates. Uh, and the model also incorporates whatever logic is necessary to make it all work together. So I'm introducing these concepts because we're going to use them now as a lens to think at a higher level about how we design data flow in our apps. And of course, much of a typical element's job as a mediator is about data flow. So without further ado, let's dig in. Now, as I mentioned, and if you've been developing with Polymer, you certainly know about Polymer's uh, broad array of low-level features for managing data. And you know, we'll touch on many of them before we're through. Uh, but our goal is not a comprehensive walkthrough of all the features. So for anything we don't cover, I can highly recommend both Arthur's thorough documentation on the site as well as Rob's awesome series of data polycasts. All right, so I want to go back to the template for our input header uh, and think about it with the mediator pattern in mind. So with that in mind, uh, we can look at this template. And it turns out that the entire model in this case, we just talked about the concept of a model for a mediator. The entire model is specified in this case entirely via the annotations in its template. Um, there's no imperative code. There's no observers. This fully describes how this element works. Specifically, it uses a number of bindings to orchestrate the flow of data, as you can see here. And of course, the square brackets here are one-way bindings. Curly braces are two-way. Now, if we want to think critically about data flow, it's important to understand how Polymer's data features work and how they impact things like performance and code complexity. Um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and visualize how data actually flows through the input header as specified by its, my, its bindings in its model. So input header contains a bunch of elements, uh, but it turns out that only these three are directly involved in data flow. So we can simplify our diagram a bit. Um, and you can see there, we have arrows representing all of the bindings in the model, including the one two-way binding between the title property and the value property of paper input. Now, suppose that the view containing our input header wants to specify what kind of icon to display. It sets the input header's icon property, starting the flow of data. And as expected, the bindings propagate the provided value down to the related properties on the paper icon button. Um, and in the next slide, it's really intended to look at what those bindings might cost us, to see what's happening under the hood. 
Rob talked through this a few minutes ago, so I'm just going to very quickly summarize. The data flows at runtime essentially because Polymer at load time has done a bunch of work for us. So based on annotations we provided in the template, Polymer automatically generated a setter. And this is pseudocode. It's not exactly what's happening. But it gives you an idea of what happens when that property is set. So it's simple, but what about the two-way binding? We can take a similar look at that. In this case, when someone types, the property value, the value property rather, of paper input changes, and that triggers the upward flow of data up to the title property of input header. And again, it's a very similar mechanism here. Uh, using the information about our mediator's model that we provided in the template annotations, uh, we give Polymer enough information to do a lot of work under the hood for us. In this case, uh, it sets up an event listener to listen for the value changed event. And that works for us because paper input, meanwhile, via a very similar mechanism, um, had an uh, automatic event dispatch added. Um, so as was the case with our one-way bindings, uh, this two-way binding is lightweight and performant because it's based on uh, native platform features, non-bubbling events, and ordinary event listeners. So in a nutshell, this is really basically how data flow works in Polymer. Um, and we refer to, the, refer to the underlying mechanism as property effects, uh, because basically it means that setting any given property deterministically causes a particular set of effects to occur. And when one property's effect causes another property to be set, the chain reaction that follows efficiently moves data from one place to another. And all of the examples we just looked at were based on bindings. Uh, the exact same system really underlies our other data features, like computed properties and observers. Um, so I just want to take a quick pause here, because we're about to zoom out and now look at more app-level data flow. Um, but uh, before we do, um, I, I just want to make a point about two-way bindings, because after all, the whole world, including you know, several people who've just gotten up on stage are talking in glowing terms about uh, unidirectional data flow. And two-way bindings are inherently bidirectional, right? <laughs> so does that mean they're evil? Um, let's go ahead and take one, one, one more look at our input header diagram. Uh, and to cut to the chase, you know, I can't think of any good reason not to use two-way bindings in a case like this. And there's you know, several reasons. So first of all, the design of the element explicitly requires that the title of the input header and the value of paper input be in sync at all times. And the model doesn't do anything else with that value. So having them bound is exactly the behavior we want. Um, the other thing to note is that you know, the values in question are all scalar values. So we don't need to worry about unintentionally mutating something out from under someone who may have passed as a value. Uh, and at the end of the day, if we weren't using a two-way binding, we'd essentially need to code the same logic ourselves by hand. So as we move upward to look at app-level data flow, we may find that there are cases where we choose not to use two-way bindings for other reasons. But in this case, uh, it's a perfectly good idea. All right then, uh, onward and appward. <laughs> um, let's take a look at data flow from the app perspective using Kevin's chat view app as our example. So the original app that Kevin built for last year employs bidirectional data flow. Um, but in preparation for this talk, I basically built an alternative version, actually a few alternative versions, using unidirectional flow. And in a couple minutes, we'll compare and contrast the two approaches. Uh, but in order to evaluate them, first we need to understand the app's model as a whole. So whereas reusable elements tend to have relatively simple, self-contained models, an app's model more often consists of nested, structured data, slices of which are often shared across views. And that's true even in the case of this simple app. So here's a reasonable, structured representation of the chat view app's data. It has a list of threads. And each thread, in turn, has an ID, a title, a list of messages. Each message has a user and the text of the message. Um, 
And we also have an object representing the user. We know the user's name, and then we have an object that we use to keep track of the last message they've looked at in every thread so that we can show the unread thread count and the little icons next to the unread threads in the list. Uh, and then lastly, we have a bit of application state. Uh, the, uh, the currently selected thread is, is here as well. So in addition to the data, we also need to think about what actions the user can take. In this case, as we discussed, it's very simple. You can select a thread, post a message, or set a thread title. Um, but there's sort of a piece in between, uh, or a related piece, and that's basically the set of mutations that we might make to our application's model as a result of events that are either driven by the user or by the application itself. And this is actually really the meat when we're trying to decide how to structure our app. Uh, this is the meat of the things that we need to consider. Um, uh, because where we choose to make these mutations uh, is all about what kind of data flow we have. So armed with this top-down model of our app, uh, we can now evaluate our options for flowing data. And until now, we've been framing this choice in terms of directionality, but as I suggested just a second ago, I actually find it easier to think about in terms of uh, distribution of responsibility. So one option is to distribute responsibility for our model fairly evenly between the views of our app, with each one taking ownership of certain aspects. And this tends to result in bidirectional data flow. The other option is to concentrate responsibility in some central place, uh, with individual view models then becoming extremely simple. And this tends to produce unidirectional flow. So here's a simple schematic diagram representing the distributed version of ChatView. Uh, the one that was built last year. Uh, and it shows how we distributed the responsibilities between the various components. So most of the choices here were obvious. Um, the mutations of the model were basically assigned to the piece of view that was responsible for displaying uh, the related data. Um, there's really only one piece of this, the, the question of where to update the last red thread that could have gone in either place. Um, but the interesting thing to note here is that uh, we have our chat thread view um, updating the last thread message, and we have the chat thread list uh, sort of calculating uh, the derived data that's based on that. And so we have uh, sort of a, um, an implicit coupling, if you will, between these two, two views through the same piece of structured data that they're mutating. And that leads to some complexity. So here's the corresponding diagram for the centralized version. And you can see our, our model there is much thicker in chat view. Uh, and the other thing to note here is right now I'm showing this centralized view as living inside of the chat view view. Um, I also actually built a separate version of this using, uh, using uh, the Redux library in which uh, the store sits outside the view altogether. And there's, uh, there's a Polymer Redux library that, um, that binds Redux to, to Polymer. So don't be worried if, uh, if you don't like the look of a, a big chunk of, uh, of logic sitting inside a view element. But in any case, you can see it's, it's much simpler because effectively all of our mutations are happening at the same place. Um, so here's a slightly more complex view. Uh, and of course, in building the app, you know, Kevin used a lot of bindings. And so it was very easy, very declarative. It's actually very elegant code uh, to do the distributed version of the app that he built last year. But the interesting thing is that underlying it, you still get a fairly uh, complex model. And so that complexity is there, even though um, it's, it's somewhat hidden from the niceties of Polymer's binding syntax. And here's the corresponding diagram for the unidirectional version. Uh, just simple one-way bindings. Okay, so now uh, we've, we've looked at it sort of schematically. I just wanna touch on a few, we're not gonna look in detail at the code, um, but we're looking at the bidirectional, or the, uh, yeah, the bidirectional version, the distributed version. Uh, and you know, one, a few things to note. So whenever we're making mutations to our structured data, we end up using the Polymer provided non-standard uh, ways of, of doing that. So here, instead of calling array push, we're calling this dot push. And that's some notifications of the changes we, we make in one view propagate to another. Um, similar, similarly, we're using this dot set here. 
Uh, and then here is a, a complex observer um, that is dependent on a, a number of uh, some deep paths uh, to, to basically uh, 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 observe changes. And, and again, this is, this is uh, some complexity here because what it means is that in a view where you're declaring one of these observers, you need to understand um, the structure of some fairly deeply nested data. So basically, again, you have sort of a coupling um, that maybe feels a little uncomfortable. I won't talk about array selector, uh, but it's, it's another sort of abstraction that comes into play as a result of the fact that we are distributing our mutations across views. So let's look at some highlights of the uh, unidirectional approach. So uh, this is one of the views in the app. And the main thing I want you to notice here is that uh, the bindings are all purely one way. So we don't have any two-way bindings. Uh, another thing to note, since we're not mutating any data inside the, the model of the views, um, we need some other way, some other mechanism to signal that an action has taken place and a mutation needs to occur. And so here we're just using uh, Palmer 1.0 uh, event uh, fire uh, method. Um, uh, I also experimented with a more React style of actually passing functions down uh, as properties, and lo and behold, that works too. Um, but you need something like this to implement unidirectional flow. And then here's the, uh, the actual app uh, template, and again, purely one-way bindings. There are no two-way bindings anywhere in this app at all. Um, and uh, you can see it's listening for, uh, for those events that are being fired by the, uh, by the child views. Um, so the other interesting thing to note is uh, because the, the view elements became so thin in terms of their model, uh, the version that I ended up working with the Redux version of the app uh, was almost identical to the one in the, in the pure polymer uh, uh, unidirectional version I did, which was another nice advantage. Um, so the, the one piece we haven't shown is how we actually uh, respond to the events in our, in our main app. In other words, what does the logic look like in that centralized model? Uh, and it, it, it doesn't look... Uh, you know, again, Kevin's version, almost purely declarative. Everything's in templates. There's a few sort of one-line functions. Here we actually have, uh, you know, some, uh, some longer bits of logic. And, and effectively what we're doing is we're listening for uh, the specific events, like setting the thread title. And you can see the last line of this we're calling it uh, this dot underscore update function. And it turns out that all of the event handlers call that at the end. And then we just have one centralized update function where we take our, our now updated data structure and uh, we use a uh, sort of uh, an immutable approach. Uh, we, you can see that there's a call here to object assign. So if we, since we know we've changed uh, the data, we, we ensure that it um, bypasses, or that it, uh, that it doesn't get tripped up by Polymer's dirty checking by creating a new, a new object. And we do the same thing uh, with uh, the messages array by calling slice. Um, and of course, in Polymer 2.0, uh, with by default uh, skipping the dirty check, uh, some of these things wouldn't be necessary, although they still might be performance optimizations. In any case, uh, a little more code in the centralized unidirectional way, uh, but also uh, a lot looser coupling um, between the views and, uh, and the containing app. Um, and I think ultimately, because we have a lot of code here that's really easy to look at in the debugger, for example, um, you know, I don't know if any of you have run into cases where you know, something's gone wrong with your bindings and you're not sure why. They can be pretty difficult to debug, and uh, code like this uh, is, is very easy. So again, uh, it's not a case where it's clear slam dunk. There's a lot of really nice things about the distributed bidirectional version, um, but there are definitely some, some good advantages that I think would become greater as your app grows and your team grows uh, to the unidirectional approach. So again, uh, I just wanted to point out the Polymer Redux library built by Christopher Turner. If you're interested at all in experimenting with Polymer plus Redux, uh, I recommend it. It's very small, uh, does its thing well. Uh, and then again, just a reminder uh, of the 
uh, some of the relevant changes in Polymer 2.0. I mentioned the one, the, the big one uh, that Rob did as well, which is that by default, it's no longer doing a dirty check on objects and arrays. The other one that, that he also mentioned, but not quite in this context, is I think an interesting uh, thing to speculate on going forward. Because if you do end up writing an application or a code base that uh, depends entirely on uh, sort of the centralized unidirectional uh, model, then there's actually a fairly significant percentage of the code in Polymer's data layer that te technically you don't need um, in that scenario. And so if you combine that fact with the sort of a la carte model of Polymer 2.0, you could imagine defining your own uh, element-based class that was you know, a lot lighter weight. Uh, and again, these were the things that we were optimizing for. And the main thing that I, the main takeaway here is, you know, you need to understand what your team looks like, what your app looks like, and think about some of the trade-offs, you know, that we looked at here today when making the, uh, you know, the choice for how you want to structure data in your app. Uh, that, at that URL, I will upload my uh, experiments. Right now it is a, uh, placeholder readme, but within the next couple of days, I'll put it up. So if you want to go and watch that repo, you'll get notifications. Um, and it might be interesting to, to play with the, the concepts. I certainly had fun. So with that, uh, enjoy your lunch. Enjoy the rest of day one. And we'll see you around.